a very good morning to all of the viewers and on the behalf of parul institute of law parul university myself dr rajesh singh uh, the moderator of this event i warm welcome our mns speaker and distinguished guest mr n venkatraman who is a senior advocate supreme court of india and additional solicitor general of india first of all i will just give a brief introduction about sir uh, sri n venkatraman sir is a senior advocate and noted jurist in the taxation and commercial law and one of the most shout after the council has been appointed as an additional solicitor general asg of india in the supreme court <coughs> Sri Vankat Raman sir is one of the youngest advocate to be designated as a senior advocate in the year 2006 at early age of 39 years and for his best performance at the court uh, with an unblemished career of more than 31 year of the professional practice before the honorable supreme court 23 high courts including the chartered uh, chartered high courts of bombay delhi calcutta and madras and the provincial and the circuit benches of the high court of the other state Mr N Venkatraman sir spheres of the expertise and knowledge spans over the indirect taxes direct taxes international taxation constitutional law regulatory laws including the tri competition law gas and electricity matters uh, moreover his proficiency in the public law received an accolades in the honorable supreme court in the sabrimalia case where in the constitutional bench was pleased to refer the case to the bench of the nine judges Mr Venkat Raman sir has also frequently addresses the law student of the most pre prestigious law school in India on the various issue concerning the national uh, the nation nationalities ethos values and the legal issue connected to it so on this platform sir i warm welcome to you uh, and i just uh, tell uh, dr ruchi tiwari who is an associate professor at parul institute of law to warm welcome our guest uh, mr n venkat raman sir ruchi tiwari ma'am Good morning, sir. So it's my privilege and honor to invite you on behalf of Parul Institute of Law, on behalf of Professor Dr. Akhil Sayed, sir, who is our dean, a uh, sir at PIL. We are we are lucky enough to have you as your one of the eminent speakers. Uh, <coughs> dean, sir, has, dean, sir, has given me the privilege to invite you, and I take it as an opportunity. Uh, I invite you on behalf of uh, Parul University. Sir, now just, sir, now just, I will tell about our Parul Institute of Law. Sir, we have uh, right now we have five years courses of BBA LLB, BBA LLB, and BCom LLB. Sir, sir, we have round about five hundred students and hundred students in the L, hundred uh, and eighty students in the LLM program. Sir, we have right now, sir, twenty eight uh, students as a PhD scholars in our university. with a different six specialization sir sir we are the one of the leading university at uh, gujarat sir and sir, we want uh, our privilege uh, that our uh, today you are at the platform at parun city and we are very much thankful for your for this kindness sir now i am handing this session on the topic of the of this uh, on this webinar for uh, for now session is handing to you sir uh, to venkat raman sir sharada sharada ambuj vadana vadana ambujai sarvatha sarvatha asmakam sarvitin sannitin kriya parul university his team and dr rajesh singh dr ruchi the students who have logged along with me in this uh, platform besides those watching in the facebook live dear friends <clears throat> it's a pleasure to relive a uh, young moments in life and whenever there is an occasion to be with students i've never said no because uh, it's first a learning process for me more than trying to share what little i know with Uh, others because you are all very updated you are all way ahead of us in many things therefore uh, the whole idea is i will broadly give an outline of theme and then we will try to engage in a discussion which will make it more meaningful rather than making a monologue speech <clears throat> see 
this is the first question I want to pose to all of you. Can you decide how to be born, where to be born, when to be born, and to whom to be born? The second question, can you decide how to die, when to die, where to die, and how to exit from this world? So if you say, yes, I have a complete control over both, then uh, you are a very different and an exceptional person to be respected. If you're going to say, no, I don't have a control between the two, on these two aspects, the entry and the exit, then ask the third question, when you have no control over your entry and exit, how is that all of you or all of us feel that we have complete control over our lives when we are alive? This is the first question which you need to ask before you probe into the further question whether somebody should respect religion, somebody should believe religion, somebody should have faith in religion. Ask that question. Can you be in complete control over all your affairs? There again, <clears throat> experience over a period of time teaches us the fact that there is something which you need to do as efforts, but there is something called results which can happen in spite of efforts, which need not happen in spite of efforts and can happen even without efforts. Therefore, the disconnect between human effort and the fruits that an action can bear is a mystery in human life. Therefore, as more and more we become material, when we say material, faith in human ego, faith in the human body, and, and, the, and the ability to be aggressive and determined, stop shortens or stuns or actually stops or even decays our ability to understand the inner principles of life. And that is what we call it as religion, irrespective of any religion is. When we use these expressions, we use it uh, as a common expression and not to signify any particular religion. So that is what our Supreme Court has also time and again said. Religion is a way of life for everyone. It, it, it unravels the mystery of things which are otherwise not known to us, which we don't, which you can neither experience it, nor presume it, in short. Because these are the two which a human mind and a human intellect is capable of capturing. It will say, I have this experience, so this is life. For somebody, diamond will be an interesting product. For somebody, something which you want to want to want to hate, and somebody says, "I'm very indifferent. It's just a stone." So, human experience on a particular object is at variance. There is no consistency. Similarly, the presumptions we make in life need not necessarily be correct every time, and therefore, <clears throat> there is a mystery beyond these experiences and presumptions. What we call it as religion. And religion is completely dependent on faith and belief. All right. <clears throat> Why are we speaking this now in a law university? Because our constitution guarantees practice, propagate and profess one's religion as a fundamental right under Article 25, subject of, of course to public order, health and morality. So subject to these three limitations, <clears throat> any citizen of this country is entitled to practice, profess and propagate his or her religion. It's a fundamental right. So let's spark the theme of religion here. We will now go to the theme. What So religion is purely based on faith and belief. It is not science. And it is not contingent about proof. It depends only on uniform, consistent, time, immemorial traditions, customs, practices, and usages. And of course, validated by texts, which the religion adores it as its fittest document for its uh, connection. 
So this is how religion has been interpreted by the constitution. Now, <clears throat> one thing is very clear. Religion is extremely personal. And of course, it is individuals who collectively gather as society and therefore it becomes a right even against the society as long as the three limitations are followed. This is the crux of religion for the time being is enough. Now, what is secularism? See, secularism is a commitment by the state that it shall remain neutral to all religions. Secularism is not becoming irreligious. See, religion is something given as a guaranteed right to its citizens. Religion has to be understood qua the citizens. Secularism has to be understood qua the state obligation. It is, it is often it exchanges, it swaps places. And that is the trouble which we are facing day in and day out in a democratic society. So, what do you mean by secular secularism? See, India traditionally is known to assimilate, view, experience life as divine. Everything is divine. Anything you see is divine. That's the inheritance which we have as a country irrespective of the religion one professes. However, we have taken to a constitution which mandates that the state will remain neutral. It will not support a particular religion or an oppose a particular religion. So Indian constitution is not a theistic constitution like Pakistan or Bangladesh or for that any matter other countries, Middle East and various other countries. So we are not a theistic constitution, we are a secular constitution. Secular constitution doesn't mean that the state has to profess or propagate atheism. That's not the criteria or condition for, for secularism. So it is, you neither have to promote theism nor have to promote atheism. You need to be neutral and indifferent. That is the obligation of state when it comes to secular credentials. Now, <clears throat> religion, qua the citizen, secularism, qua the state, where is the flashpoint? Why is, where is the melting point? Where is the flashpoint? Where is the area or zones of conflict that we experience day in and day out? That is because of what we call it as a democratic polity. See, <clears throat> assume for a minute, how do we, op as a citizen, how should you practice your constitution? Because it's the constitution is our Gita. We are bound by it. And as lawyers, as law students, as citizens, it's our moral and ethical and legal duty to uphold it. At every point of time, we have the responsibility and the duty to uphold the constitution. So, when individuals have a fundamental right and state has a moral duty to ensure that one doesn't get into a zone of friction, as a citizen, how can this be best practiced? It can be best practiced if you allow religion, practice of religion for your own progress as something within your home, something within your community, something within your society of people where you have the same alignment of thought process. <laughs> you cannot transcend this line and exceed it and come into public domain, which in the name of professing or propagating, one has no right to hurt anyone's religion at any point of time. It's, it's nasty. It's indecent, it is immoral, and it's unethical. And uh, time and again, courts have pronounced very clear verdicts on that to say that practice or professing religion doesn't mean hurting another religion. So we have no business to do that. 
this is the limitation each citizen has to practice when it comes to his religious fervor religious tolerance religious attitude either in public or in private now what happens historically is when we frame the constitution as a democratic polity going by the backdrop of what happened in prior to 1947 and just immediately before 1947 and post 1947 this constitution was written say 75 years ago 72 years ago so the constitution though had guaranteed religion as a fundamental right though did not use the word secular even though supreme court nine judges said it was always a secular constitution and came only by way of an amendment in the 42nd constitution amendment now what happened as a backdrop is and as a matter of practices the beauty of india is we are a plural society you take the majority religion it has thousands and thousands of castes you take the other religions they through the constitutional pro- process has been identified as minority religion these are all constitutional designs so <clears throat> you have a major religion which is fragmented into caste and you have other religions identified as minority religions by the constitution and when you run that democratic polity ultimately democracy works in india or for that matter any country works is by through the power of franchise and voting and you reach governance only that way that's the only mode today available in the world and that to in india so a may when it comes to the major religion democratic polity plays the game in the name of caste and there are several things which are assured even in the const- constitution which necessarily needs to be supported because there is something which all of us have a social duty to ensure people at least people with whom we come into contact if they are found to be oppressed then we have a moral obligation a constitutional duty to ensure what little can we extend to say they live, lead a life of decency it's a obligation and it's cast on every citizen and it is human and uh, this is the philosophy in which the constitution was drafted to ensure we uplift them to the best of our abilities with a uni, uni, unified and unisame mind with a unison thought <laughs> this is the constitutional objective but what happens in reality is political game and election game and democratic play a uh, polity plays a different real life games which we have been seeing elections after elections in this country and unfortunately in india you you are un- no government is able to perform beyond a point of time beyond a, because it's like a quarter as we go for semester examinations we go for quality half hourly examination you you constantly have to face elections because it it's a big country with a federal setup and elections happen round the clock round the year year after year and every quarter so this is becoming a live issue when it comes to the major religion when it comes to minor minor religions there is this this sub fragmentation of caste is not much and therefore the consolidation is aimed at the religion itself at the level of the religion itself so you break the majority then you consolidate the minority and then try to win elections in the name of religion has been the working methodology for 70 decades so why i share all this to your to you as students is now each one tries their best to contribute you have a challenge ahead of you you have to unite yourself 
you will have to address this at some point of time so that all of you to that sense of togetherness the sense of uh, belongingness the sense of an indian ethos the sense of an indian value freedom needs to be restored and all of you have a constitutional obligation because you are law students and that's why i uh, requested dr rajesh let's this topic is not to talk about a profess about a particular religion this is not a religious discourse it's a constitutional discourse on what is religion and what is secularism and what is democratic polity in our constitution so this is the basis on which uh, the struggle the political struggle happens and the it becomes aggressive it becomes violent it becomes turbulent and today you what happens you have an elected government and when the elected government whether it's a state or center it's it's the same because you you have this same type of uh, uh, ropos staying type of protest happening even at the state level when legislations are passed so when a constitutionally elected government is in power and it wants to do something it may be good it may be bad in the perception of the people if it is bad the constitutional process says goes go and test it in courts whereas we have found out a new mechanism that the public at large can be brought into to oppose it and ensure so this is these are all new creations you must grow with it see this will all only grow further it will only deepen it will become stronger in your lifetimes but you must instead of being part of it not being part of it as lawyers apply your mind dispassionately as to what is the process that is happening you can't be emotional like any other citizen is you have a moral responsibility and legal duty to find out what is happening is this a constitutionally sustainable mechanism irrespective of the decision being good or we are not taking any particular act to see whether it's good or bad the topic is not on that so these are all the things which are happening successively now in the last 15 20 years and especially in the last 10 12 years so you has a challenge you are on a crossroad because democratic polity now works only on these blends is what is the challenge is what is the confrontation and as a result of this there is a radicalization you get fundamentalism you get support in the form of terrorism bloodshed violence all in the name of religion so it ultimately if you go through the constitutional process the constitution guarantees you to practice profess without hurting any one's religion so i have brought three parameters now i'll bring the fourth parameter so that the four pillars are brought into record and of course there's a fifth pillar also to it and uh, then we can take questions so one is religion another is secularism third is the real life democratic polity and now fourth is the role of judiciary in interpreting this aspects because you're going to be part of the system soon or some maybe even be part of the system already see if you see the design of the constitution you will find article 14 19 and 21 the golden triangle preceding article 25 to 28 the equality class the freedom class and the liberty class so this triangle nuances or enhances individual freedoms and liberties and guarantees subject to the test of equality then comes article 25 to 28 the guarantees to profess practice and propagate religion subject to whatever the constitutional design is 
Then the tail end of it is Articles 29 and 30, which deals with the rights for the minority community, minority religions. So, religion is packaged between 14 to 21 and 29 to 30. So, it all finally depends on how judiciary views constitution. If you see the history for 70 years, any attempt to nuance, enhance the privileges of individuals through 19 or 21 has or exerts a direct pressure on 25 to 28. Because it can, it will go even, there are judgments which even takes you to the extreme of feeling, is, does the constitution mean religion being it respects an atheist as much as somebody who follows a religion. Because as somebody has a right to practice religion, somebody can also be an atheist. And he should also be respected. He also has other constitutional rights. He may be different from you in practice of religion. Otherwise, he's a citizen. So you have to respect him. So in this bandwidth, if judgments are going to enhance or nuance more and more of individual liberties of freedom and liberty, uh, liberty and equality, it interferes on the aspects of faith and belief, which is the foundation of any religion. And as a result, what is happening to the modern youth, students like all of you here, you all believe that rights and freedoms are far superior than religious beliefs, faiths, and practices. This is exactly the uh, impact which all of you are facing today in life, as a matter of fact. So to you, these are more fundamental than practicing one's own religion, because you see democratic polity is played only on the religious card by everyone. And it has been done for the past 72 years without exception. So your lifetime, your real life experience of democratic polity and the comfort which courts give you saying you have the liberty, you have so from a religious model, you slowly move away into an individual model. Constitution means it has to be only about individual rights and liberties. It's unconcerned about society. This is the conclusion a modern mind very easily comes into because I'm, I'm talking to students. I say all this because I learned from all of you, your experiences, your views. So I have to necessarily address those views. So this is as young citizens of India, judicial interpretation, real life politics, and the constitution as a document. There is a complete disconnect. One doesn't actually gel with the other. And all of us think nuancing individual liberties will achieve a bigger or a greater society. Individuals have to be nuanced. It's a continuous process. But each country has its own traditions. Each country has its own ethos, its value system. This country is called the Karma Bhumi by the whole world. It respects us for our invaluable treasures which we possess, which, is, which has antecedents running to millions of years before the constitution was made. And therefore, our and constitution has brought it as part of part three. If constitution has diversity, that's a different story. When constitution has said this needs to be protected, nurtured and also professed or propagated as ethos. I'm not talking of a particular religion or a particular religious ritual or right. Please understand the country has a value system. 
inherited over a period of time when i say what is the difference so you are saying the same thing in a different way no i say different things with different ways intention when i speak of a i do render religious discourses like regularly when i speak of a when i render a religious discourse i deal with that religion and and deal with people who profess that religion but when you wear the robe as a constitutional lawyer as a somebody to speaking to students this is not what i am attempting to say please understand the difference what i am attempting to say is this nation has citizens who are plural in nature in terms of castes communities and religions but all of us value india for its own treasures which is common to all of us there is no difference there when it comes to our inheritance of our ethos which is time immemorial all of us claim a prayer over it now can that be a meeting point for all of us to converge which happened 30 years back in my life amongst our friends we did not have the insecurity one over the other when we were school children whereas all of you face insecurity because the fifth angle is the, the public domain the public uh, media the social media individual media all put together it is no longer confined to press or media it's a whole lot so all this aid you and give you the freedom to express whatever you feel you can and therefore public domain is now filled with thoughts irrespective of whether they are right or wrong because the logic today is who are you to say i am right or wrong i have i i can express whatever i feel is right if it is wrong to you it is right to me so rights and wrongs are vanishing what i think right is right to me so nobody can adjudicate there is no ground rule to say which is right and which is wrong and we say all this in the name of freedom and therefore the real life democratic polity aided emotionally with technological opportunities for you to express whatever you feel that you can express in public domain creates aggression chaos confusions and no young student is interested to know what is the truth of life we did undergo this challenge when we were law students whereas all of you are undergoing this challenge so you are blurred you have no idea about what our treasures are in respect to the religion to which you belong you are now wearing a mask you are wearing uh, uh, dark uh, uh, colored glasses which blurs your vision and you are you are given the liberty by the world to say your ego matters the most nothing you need not know anything you can express opinion on anything it's like me talking for one hour on covid what will happen to all of you if i give a lecture on covid today millions of people are giving lecture on covid whether they know about it or not no criteria no no there is no proof you need not be knowledgeable in what you speak so i am putting or flagging all these issues in a youth's mind for you to actually assimilate and understand where you actually stand today in the world and you are promoting it and being part of it and nuancing it and enhancing it further you have to apply your mind you have it is your country see unless a country has its own uh, peace between see our country as a tradition has assimilated values that is secularism pre constitutional secularism what is pre constitutional secularism anyone who comes to this land inherits the soil finds himself or herself to be part of the soil respects 
the values and sentiments and the emotions and the traditions of the soil. So, true Indian secularism is an assimilation process. Whereas, the scheme today you have all over the world, including India, is not an assimilation process. See, as an assimilation process, you have only duties to perform towards each other. I should respect your religion and you should respect my religion. For which we must first know and practice our own religion. Now you don't practice your religion. And when you don't practice your own religion, how will you expect, how will you regard or respect somebody's religion? You can say, yeah, yeah, I have to respect. That is all. It's only verbal. You will, unless you go through these emotional experiences, how will you respect somebody's value? So, the system of secularism, which is time immemorial in India, is assimilate the greatness, richness of this ethos and be part of it. And all of us could live in peace and cooperation in cycles. And whenever there was aggression or invasion or enmity or fight or hatred or violence, then it has only produced volcanoes. So we have recorded history showing both. So as a youth, as a student, especially as a future lawyer, what is going to be your contribution in ensuring all of us live peacefully and in an harmony? Peace and harmony was a natural state during our school days. It's becoming an unnatural state in your, in your school and college days. So, it's time for you to think. You got the five verticals clearly. The religious vertical, the secular vertical, the democratic vertical, the legal vertical of judiciary and of course the media. Now, unless all this shape well, you at least as lawyers, I'll take another three minutes, 1040 and conclude and take questions for 20 minutes. As lawyers, your role is to align yourself with judiciary and contribute your very best in ensuring this discussion of fragmenting the majority and appeasing the minority and pitting. Suppose a decision comes immediately. When I say majority and minority in decision making, I don't mean it from a religious angle. A few is opposed to a decision of a Supreme Court. Immediately they will go and say this is a majoritarian view. Now what's wrong? Because in a democratic society, you can't please everybody every time. You have an obligation not to displease. But the greatest happiness is the greatest number. And if it can encompass religions and caste in multifold, and you still go and say, and no, 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 this is majoritarian view and declare it. Now you try to give some decision in favor of a minority for some reason, then immediately somebody stands up and says, this is appeasement. So don't get into these terminologies. These are, these are all simply patal for each one of you. Harness, be friend unless you are friendly with your own communities and with communities of other religions and castes. Unless this is human, basic human requirement. You don't need a constitutional mandate to thrust it on you. How do you evolve? So, youth is one point where you can either become inflammable or stand for unity and peace. 
you now have a choice. We didn't have a choice because we led a peaceful life in, in our youth. We are seeing all these things happening in the last 10, 15 years after we have become sufficiently aged. Whereas you are traveling with this chaos, you are part of a chaos. Anything there is turbulence, anything there is violence. So you have a role to play and see whether can you work towards peace and harmony for which you must be extremely religious, you must have faith and you must respect every religion and every caste. And whenever there is an occasion for you to lift somebody in society, put your shoulders to that and move the wheel. You can do five people in your life, doesn't matter. Do it for that five. It's not that everybody should reach millions. These are the, if individual dimensions achieve that perfection, then social dimensions get re-engineered properly. And when social engineering recorrects itself, then the motion, nation moves forward with prosperity and growth. So with these words, I thank Rajesh uh, for constantly uh, talking to me. And uh, this is a wonderful person, lovable game. Thank you, sir. And, uh, sir, and it, it is it is a really a great pleasure, sir. And uh, sir, you are the senior most most advocate, and uh, you have a vast experience. You have elaborated this topic in a very systematic way, sir. Uh, sir, you have uh, elaborated the five pillars that is the religion, secularism, democratic, legality, and the media in a very specific way. Sir, uh, basically our student have uh, gone through from last three days, they are working on this. So I just ask uh, the students, uh, first of all, I will ask uh, Mr. Chinmay Gandhi to put a question on uh, uh, question to Sir. Mr. Chinmay Gandhi. Yes, sir, please. Sir, my question to you is with regarding to the Constitution of India <coughs> as guaranteed. I want to ask you that anti-conversion law affects the freedom of religion and secularism. See, uh, if you, there is a clinical answer to it and there is a real life answer to it. Propagation cannot lead. You, you can propagate your religion, you can profess your religion. But where does it say you can go for forceful conversion? Before you reach the point of anti-conversion law, you must cross that stage of the practice which is rampant in India of forced conversion. Right. If you say, deny and prove there is no forced conversion in India, then the antidote for that is also not required. I see. If you have this, then you have to balance the system is one school of thought. I, I don't want to say right or wrong and give a conclusive uh, uh, approach uh, uh, because I'm serving, uh, I'm a serving law officer, but you must understand the perspective to it. For example, if you read the history of conversion, right? forced conversion, it happens more often. It starts from the sea coast and it starts traveling interior. And if you apply your mind very systematically and find out why this is happening more on the sea coast. For people in the sea coast, you and I have deities to worship. You and I have temples to worship. You and I have functions to celebrate. Whereas these people over a period of time have lost their connect to the sea deities. How many temples do you, you have temples in lands across India. Right. How many do you have in the seashore? See, you go right. for, you have thousands of channels today. Right. You uh, uh, telecasting millions of festivals of all religions. 
how many channels are beaming postal festivals so they look abandoned right and when somebody says i will take you over it becomes a transition point this happens again in economics this happens also see i i have very good friends who are all my close friends who have all come up in life now they used to say when they belong to that category of people where i, I mean they have all people who have undergone oppression they used to say we don't want money we don't want we want recognition see the philosophy that's why you say it's plural in nature so when somebody says all right you need recognition throw your tag in this religion come to my religion you will get recognized so these are the areas through which conversion actually happens so unless you work on that it's not possible to comment on this law on a stand alone basis that's my view Oh, thank you very much, sir. sir. Very well, sir. Very well explained, sir. Now we have sir second student uh, Radhika Jagtap. She is uh, the student of LLM. Uh, Radhika, can you ask question to sir? Radhika, namaste. Yes, thank you, Rajesh sir, and uh, namaste sir. It was a pure pleasure to listen to your interesting talk. uh sir um i would like to ask uh, that for example when we speak of secular standards or application of secularism in different countries let's say us and india so in us there is a clear cut language where they say there is there should be separation between state and the uh, the church and whereas in india the standards are applied through human rights where uh, it is said that we all have freedom to worship or right to worship any faith or religion so so from constitutional law point of view uh, what difference does that make which difference it's Thank a, you, in fact i would uh, say uh, like uh, chinmay this is a very very uh, significant question it's a very apt question also uh, radhika you have to see both are democratic societies both us and india but uh, the constitutional nuances are different you don't have issues like caste issues of like reservation issues like uh, minority rights it is when you see when you go in that path of democracy all of you start from the same point and run the same uh, race the same distance and one who has merit reaches then you will have lesser problems in that society for example within india you have systems where organizations work purely on merit your promotions is on merit your scale of pay is on merit you achieve something you get paid where there is fair competition and fair opportunity you will not have issues at all but india is a different case it has a huge legacy inherited legacy of one end have having oppressed caste and communities on the other end who have been able to rule this earth so the bandwidth is true too large and it has several fractions to it so constitution had to deal caste see for example in the reservation policy if india now it is seven decades old if all of you can think as students that how we can achieve the american model you need to give reservation to ensure the oppressed comes out of that oppression and gets elevated it's a constitutional obligation we should do that now but one suppose a particular individual has attained he has become an ias officer he has got good education he has reached some status in the society should you continue reservation for the family thereafter is something which we should think then you can achieve the american model but which who will think about it because it has a ramification in terms of votes and every 3 months we go for elections in some state or the other and even a bipol is now becoming a a, a war a war 
like a situation so like similarly you gave some rights for the minority institution 70 years back because assurances were required now what happens you nuance those rights through judgments or through legislations then the majority is saying why are we not treated as equals in our own country this is the dimension so you are given some benefit assurances based on the backdrop at that point of time so should we need to go so it's time for you see we are when we are changing everything when we want a overhaul of everything all of you as lawyer should also deliberate whether the basic structure document and uh, basic structure uh, principle should remain static or it is better it becomes dynamic this is you you will have to necessarily in your lifetime examine this issue i do not know whether it will happen in our lifetime but it's bound to daunt you at some point of time see you created a constitution to maintain equilibrium based on the position 70 years back now that is standing up today to expose you the disequilibrium which the system is creating and therefore do you need a basic structure doctrine still is again one point of view then we can reach possibly the american model either in your lifetime or three four generations thereafter but somewhere you have to make the move is the answer that at least sir it was very well explained uh, sir i have one more student uh, mr lognatham can you put your video on and ask the question to sir mr oh. lognatham sure i'm sure Uh, Please I put your video on. So very is, there, is there? Is there? Sir, good morning. Sir, sir, sir. First, uh, that your lecture is very, very, and that you have nicely elaborated the concept of this religion and the secularism, which has broadened my understanding. It broadened my origin of understanding this concept, sir. So the my question uh, is that, what is the present status of atheism in the concept of religion? as enumerated in the indian constitution sir what is the present state of atheism atheism uh, yeah see no no uh, see don't think uh, atheism is something which is born because of the constitution or after the constitution atheism was always part of theism <laughs> time you have have you not seen uh, even in the days of ramayana even in the days of mahabharata the, the conversation between japali and rama in the ramayana is worth reading pure atheism nothing but pure atheism filtered atheism <laughs> jabali preaches rama huh? and the, has the conviction to convince rama to say that no rama you are wrong i am right so atheism is will always remain in as part of any cult when there are people to propose there will be somebody to oppose but two things the constitution guarantees atheism as also a way of life it doesn't say you can't be an atheist it doesn't say if you are an atheist you will lose your fundamental rights it doesn't say somebody who practices religion will be equally respected with somebody who does not practice religion but being an atheist is your individual choice you have no right you can even profess atheism because that is also it's also a a, a carve out of a religion but you cannot hurt you cannot talk ill of mata sita you cannot talk ill of krishna without knowing rasa krida krishna what is how can you worship there is so much in hindu pantheon in pantheon of gods each episode each event is embedded to convey esoteric philosophical and emotional meaning to it unless you read it unless you understand it why krishna danced no you don't read it people who profess also don't read it and therefore you question it then people who don't read it also starts disbelieving it this is today so the the differ, difference between atheism and practitioners of religion without understanding 
is rather dangerous that population is enlarging especially among the youth you ask people they will all say hey, krishna can't they will treat krishna as one more individual you must know the power of and divinity of krishna for which you have to know krishna for which you have to read about krishna and you must go and see the experiences people have by worshiping krishna none of that none. when you don't have any of these things and you will say show me proof this is the problem today so you cannot hurt another religion and that is not a fundamental right this is where atheism stops under the constitution sir it was uh, very well answered by you sir uh, sir really sir i have also listened various lectures but today lecture is really a very exceptional one to me also because i have also learned a uh, lots of things and my student are already uh, learning sir for this note sir i am very much thankful to you sir for sparing a valuable time to our university and sir secondly sir i would like to invite you whenever any vacation or you, you will get the time sir at our university at a physically sir and uh, sir it is a great pleasure and uh, sir sir secondly sir you know i am getting the messages that it was uh, means they want to ask more question but as our time constraint is here but still i will put certain question on your whatsapp sir so that you can just reply for for the few students they are already on the lined up sir please, please you can so, do one thing or i do you can send me a mail or a whatsapp yes, i will give you audio yes, send it to you you can give it to them uh, let's let's try to address yes, as many issues yes sir now i will tell ruchi tiwari madam to give a vote of thanks uh, to sir ruchi tiwari ma'am thank you once again to all of you and before rashi says it's a pleasure to have yeah 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 yes yes ruchi tiwari ma'am yes sir uh, thank you rajesh sir thank you so much sir uh, for uh, thank you to man sir for being with us it was uh, such an enlightening session and again uh, i'll thank you on behalf of parl institute behalf of professor dr akhil okay. sayed sir it's our privilege to have you and even i can uh, i take this privilege to invite you on behalf of parl university uh, uh, maybe physically one day if possible post covid when everything goes okay so we'll be lucky enough to have you positively uh, uh, as a physical and uh, in physical over here so thank you so much sir for this enlightening session i thank uh, uh, all the student participants who have taken out time i thank rajesh sir for uh, doing such kind of so interactive webinars and always putting uh, everything in forefront and doing it and i thank uh, uh, the team of uh, webinars who organizes us uh, such a good uh, webinars for us thank you so much thank you thank you sir thank you pranam so thank on you, this sir. note sir i am thankful to you sir and i am thankful to uh, mr jitin kobani sir for giving a good live coverage thanks a lot sir thank you sir thank you venkatraman sir thanks a lot sir thank you very much thank you okay sir okay sir okay.